Great. Well, we're very glad to have Anibal Banu from Harvard, who's going to tell us about regular centralizers and the wonderful compactification. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's really nice to, to be here. I mean, here in my living room, but also here at Stanford AG seminar. So, um, so, so I'm a rep theorist. Um, so I will tell you about a family of projects that's sort of a blend of rep theory and, and some algebraic geometry and some symplectic or Poisson geometry. Uh, and I, I also want to repeat what Ravi said that I really welcome questions. So I, I've tried to kind of um, to kind of make a plan to talk about things that I thought people here would find interesting, but it's really good if, um, if there are clarifications along the way. Okay, uh, so, so the, the title of my talk is Regular Centralizers and the Wonderful Compactification. So I'll begin with just a brief reminder of the wonderful compactification of a semi-simple adjoint, adjoint group, um, how we construct it, and what um, great properties it has that are going to be sort of useful to us today. So throughout this talk, uh, G is going to be a semi-simple algebraic group of adjoint type. Uh, adjoint type means that the center, the center of G is trivial. Uh, and if you want, sort of throughout, you can imagine that this guy is PGLN. And then I'll write G tilde for the simply connected cover. So you can pretend that this is SLN. And then I'll fix uh, for now a regular irreducible representation of this simply connected cover, where by regular, I mean irreducible representations of G tilde are indexed by dominant weights. And I want uh, the weight corresponding to this irreducible representation to lie in the interior of the dominant cone. Uh, so if you think about SL3, for example, here's a picture of the vial chambers. And, uh, and this representation should be somewhere in this cone, but shouldn't lie on any of the walls. And if I set up this data, uh, then I can make the following definition. So the representation map gives me uh, a map from G tilde to non-zero endomorphisms of V. And on the left, I can quotient by the center. And on the right, I can quotient by scalars. And because I picked a regular representation, uh, the top horizontal arrow is going to descend to an embedding of the group G into this projectivized endomorphism space. And the wonderful compactification is just the closure of the image of this embedding. So this construction is independent of the regular representation we chose. And it always gives us a smooth variety on which the group G acts uh, on the left and on the right, just extending left and right multiplication of the group on itself. Okay, uh, so so before I give an example, uh, I, I want to say- well, okay, let, me, let, me, let me already, uh, great. So that was like a way faster definition than I'd seen, of, like, I'd seen more awkward definitions before, but that was like a- uh, but so the so but, and it also makes me think that when I go to the boundary when I'm not regular then I get presumably you get like the you must get beautiful uh, uh, maybe more say, like non wonderful but pretty wonderful things that uh, as well or maybe yeah. Like, yeah so there's there's like a whole theory of like equivariant compactifications of the group G. Um, or, or of like symmetric spaces more generally, or of like spherical varieties even more generally. And, um, and what can I say about these? So, so there are two kind of classes of such compactifications that people study. Um, one class is called toroidal, which, um, which roughly means that the boundary divisor is sort of like big. So it's like normal crossings divisor and, and these, these compactifications are indexed by some kind of like combinatorial data, like colored fans. So that's that's kind of the class of big compactifications of G. And then there's also a class of, of kind of very small compactifications of G, which are the ones that have a unique closed orbit. And these are the ones you're gonna get if you let your, um, your irreducible representation go to the boundary. Cool, 
Correct. And and this when when uh, when these two classes of compactifications overlap, they overlap in a single object, and that's the wonderful compactification. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the boundary boundary of G bar looks like a normal crossings divisor with smooth irreducible components, and there are as many irreducible components as their simple roots, so as the rank of the group. And the G cross G orbits on the boundary are indexed by subsets of simple roots in the sense that if I take um, the partial intersection of divisor components corresponding to a subset J, I'm going to get um, an orbit closure, the closure of the orbit OJ. So in particular, in particular, I should say here, there's a unique closed orbit of minimal dimension. And this just corresponds to intersecting all the irreducible components of the divisor. And these orbits have a very, very nice geometry. Uh, so, so for every uh, subset of simple roots J, I can fix some, some um, data from the group. So I can, I have two corresponding parabolic subgroups. You should think uh, when you see parabolic subgroups, you should think that these are sort of like block upper triangular subgroups. And then PJ minus is just gonna be the reflection of PJ across the diagonal. And LJ is gonna be their intersection. So it's gonna be some kind of block diagonal subgroup of SLN, so in particular, a reductive group. And then I can make the following statement. The, um, uh, the orbit corresponding to the subset J has a vibration over this product of partial flag varieties that I get from the two parabolics. And the fiber is this common levy component modulo its center. And then what you notice is that because I quotiented by the center, this is now a semi-simple group of adjoint type. And uh, if I want to take closures, so if I want to, to consider the closure of the orbit OJ bar, um, I just put closures everywhere. So in other words, the, the closure of this Jth orbit fibers over this product of partial flag varieties, and the fiber is just a wonderful compactification of a group of smaller rank. And in particular, we have our unique uh, closed orbit of minimal dimension, which happens when my parabolic this is what's called a Borel. So this looks like the subgroup of upper triangular matrices. And then its opposite is just lower triangular matrices. And in this case, the minimal orbit, which is already closed. Well, in this case, this uh, Levy component is the diagonal matrices. So it's already abelian when I quotient by the center, I'll get something trivial. So this minimal orbit is just going to be a product of two copies of the flag variety of the group. Okay, so let's see an example. Uh, example when GSPGL2, in this case, the simply connected cover is SL2. And the irreducible representations are just indexed by uh, non-negative integers. And all the non-zero ones are regular because they are in the interior of the dominant cone, which is just a ray. Okay, so, so I pick the simplest one, which is just the standard representation. And then I run this game from, from the definition two slides ago. And I get just the usual embedding of PGL2 into projectivized two by two matrices uh, as those with non vanishing determinant. So when I take the closure of the subset, I will get the entire space of projectivized two by two matrices, which looks like a copy of P3. And the boundary divisor is going to consist of matrices whose determinant vanishes. And uh, this is isomorphic to a product of two copies of P1 
by like the Segram bedding. And P1 is the flag variety of SL2. So in this case, the, there's, a, there's just a single component to the divisor, which is the closed PGL2 cross PGL2 orbit, just looks like product of two copies of P1. So, so should I think of that? There's only one smooth boundary divisor, but should there mm -hmm. really be, uh, is that one smooth boundary divisor or are there also components? Should I really see that as like an A2 and then two A1s and then like, a, like the matrices that are, uh, like the zero matrix and the, uh, no, I guess I don't have the zero matrix there because you forget to rise. So yeah, so is it just the divisor? There's no some other, you don't consider, it's, it's not gratified by small stuff. Yeah, there's, there's nothing else. Right. Uh, so yeah, but the, so this example, this example doesn't generalize. So if I take PGL n for n greater than or equal to three, then the standard representation is not regular anymore because that's one of the fundamental representations that like generates the dominant bile cone. And, and the wonderful compactification of, of G is not just an N squared minus one dimensional projective space. That's something more complicated. This is still a compactification of G, like, um, like we were saying before. But if you think about what the boundary looks like, it's going to look like the vanishing locus of the determinant again. But the determinant when n is greater than or equal to three is going to have singularities where like the rank of the singular matrix drops. So, so, this, so, so the boundary divisor in this case is not going to be smooth. Okay. Uh, so, so, so now uh, regular centralizers. Uh, so, so for a second, let me give some definitions. Uh, I'm going to say that a a uh, point uh, in the Lie algebra is regular if the dimension of its centralizer under the adjoint action is equal to the rank of the group. So this is the smallest dimension that a centralizer can have. So the regular locus of, of the Lie algebra consists of Lie algebra elements whose orbit under the adjoint action has maximal dimension. And in SLN, for example, there's a really concrete description of what it means for, for an n by n matrix to be regular. It just means that when I put it into Jordan normal form, the Jordan blocks have distinct eigenvalues. So for example, um, if I take an element S that's regular and semi-simple, uh, this means uh, in SLN diagonalizable with distinct eigenvalues. Then its centralizer is a maximal torus. So again, in SLN, this just looks like the subgroup of diagonal matrices. And its closure uh, in the wonderful compactification is going to be the closure of this maximal torus. So this is a projective toric variety. And these are indexed by fans. And the fan corresponding to this one is the fan of vial chambers. So sometimes people call this the coxeter toric variety. So in particular, this closure T bar is smooth. Okay, and then in the other extreme, so this is the case of a, of a regular semi-simple element, I can pick an element of the Lie algebra that's regular and nil potent. So according to this example, if I'm an SLN, regular null potent should mean that I only have a single maximal Jordan block with eigenvalue zero. So this is going to look like the null potent element uh, that has ones above the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And the centralizer of this guy is now going to be some degeneration of maximal tori. So it's still an abelian group, but it's, uh, it's now an additive group. So it's, uh, it's isomorphic to a product of, of rank many copies of C. And then in SLN in particular, this abelian groups look, group looks like uh, it consists of unipotent matrices. So one's along the diagonal and zero is below. And then constant entries along each super diagonal.
And then the question of what does its closure and the wonderful compactification look like is, um, is one of the questions that I want to answer today and it's sort of not as obvious as the semi-simple case. Okay, so to, um, to answer this question, what I want to do is consider these regular centralizers in a kind of family parametrized by the regular elements, or rather parametrized maybe by the regular um, adjoint orbits or conjugacy classes. So let me give uh, a definition. Uh, we'll fix a, a, an SL2 triple in G. So this is a triple of three elements E, H, and S that together generate a copy of SL2 inside G. And I want them all to be regular. And then it's a theorem of constant that if I take the affine space that consists of F plus the Lie algebra of the centralizer of E, this affine space uh, lies entirely in the regular locus and it intersects every regular adjoint orbit in exactly one point and transversely. So this is kind of a cross section to the regular adjoint orbits in the Lie algebra. And just a, a quick example, what does the space look like for like SL4, for example? It looks like four by four matrices with zeros on the diagonal, constant entries along the super diagonals, ones just below the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And the statement, uh, or one of the consequences of the statement is that every regular four by four traceless matrix is conjugate to a unique thing of this form. Okay, and now, now we can make the following definition. So say that the universal centralizer of this Lie algebra G is the family of regular centralizers parametrized by points in this constant slice. And the first... Um, so, so the fact that it's, I'm guessing the fact that it's smooth is going to be easy, but the symplectic form is not at all obvious? So these words are not really part of the definition, but I, I put them there because I didn't know to put them. So, uh, so, so what I, the first kind of family of questions that I want to address is, is where does the symplectic structure come from? And then how do we compactify the fibers of this family? So I'm gonna take the closure of, of each centralizer fiber inside the wonderful compactification and understand what I get. And then how does the symplectic structure that I had on C extend on this, um, on this relative compactification? So it, does it extend to something and what does it extend to? And these, these three questions turn out to be kind of um, very much related to one another. So in, in order to talk about um, uh, all three of them, we'll need to, to uh, work in the framework of, of, um, of Poisson manifolds. So I, I will first give like a sort of quick recollection of what Poisson structures are and how they fit into to the story. And then I'll show in the context of, of plus on spaces, how this universal centralizer appears, and then we'll see the symplectic structure and we'll see the, the answer to all these questions. Right, so, so what we're expecting, so we're in a fully, so we're, in a, we're gonna have, so it's gonna be symplectic, but everything is fully algebraic. So it can make algebraic, it's gonna be symplectic, but in a fully algebraic sense. The thing when we compactify is gonna be singular. So we're dealing with things that deserve the name symplectic, even when, uh -huh. uh, even when they're singular, or there's something which, uh, we're in the sort of uh, maybe yeah, so, area for me where th things are symplectic but singular. So, so, so actually, um, nothing will be singular. So, so this Z bar is going to be smooth. Oh, then I'm less scared. Oh, so it's okay. That's that's wonderful. Maybe literally. But it's not going to be symplectic anymore because oh. the symplectic form is going to get kind of like poles on the boundary. But there's um, there's like a way to talk about this in in the setting of Poisson geometry. Uh, so, so, so I mean, the fibers of Z-bar will, will be singular, some of them. The generic fiber will be this T-bar, which is smooth, but then the, the special fibers will get singularities, but the total space will be smooth. 
Okay, so, so here's the definition. Um, I'm being deliberately ambiguous by, by what I mean by manifold M. So M could be like a complex manifold or it could be a real manifold or it could be a smooth algebraic variety and, and OM could be like holomorphic functions or smooth functions or like the structure sheaf of our smooth algebraic variety and the definition would be exactly the same. Um, so so uh, a Poisson structure on an object like this is a bracket on the space of function that is a Lie bracket, so it, it satisfies uh, the Jacobi property and it's bilinear and skew-symmetric. And it also satisfies this thing called the Leibniz property, which says that the bracket is a derivation in each coordinate. And then the fact that this bracket is a derivation in each coordinate means that it corresponds to a bivector field on the manifold. Those derivations correspond to vector fields and by derivations correspond to bivector fields. So I'll admit that I've seen the definition for I saw my eyeballs, they've gone through my eyeballs before, like what's on this page, but uh -huh. I've never understood, I, I, I suspect I'm about to, like the why you would, to me, the, it's just like a bunch of symbols, whereas I understand why you have Leibniz and why, well, I, individually I understand why. So but in the example, I guess what we see why the structure would be expected to be there, and then then it's magical that once we have it, you can do stuff with it. Which, or, like the Poisson structure? Yeah, the, the notion of Poisson structure is uh, yeah. uh, is already, uh, I mean, I, okay, the definition I've seen, but uh -huh. I, don't appreci I don't appreciate it yet. Uh, okay. Maybe I shouldn't admit that in public, but. <laughs> Uh, but I'll, but maybe I will. But you know, no, I like to appreciate things. But I, 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 I appreciate the next symplectic things. What's that? You appreciate symplectic I, things. I've learned. You're, no, right. I, I initially did not. Right. I, I, like anything, I didn't appreciate symplectic things the first time I saw them, and then I appreciate because then then I learned that the structure, you know, is common, and then you you do these things with them, and then you are able to prove these theorems. And in this case, um, I should say what you had the previous page. I want to know the answer to. So like, I, I will be convinced by the fact that you can prove these things, but why mm -hmm. these, but uh, so what I'm, I, I guess I'm secretly saying that I'm in the course of seeing what you're about to do, I want to get some sense as to why Poisson structures are the, like why these, why these are so, why these are so much the right thing to do. Okay, okay, I'm gonna do my best. Good, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so 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 this um, this Poisson structure I defined it as a bracket on on the algebra of functions of my manifold, but then I said that um, that such brackets are in sort of one to one correspondence with with bivector fields uh, that that maybe have some additional structure. So um, so so the first thing to notice is that when I have a bivector field, it always gives me a map from the cotangent bundle to the tangent bundle by just taking a one form and contracting the bivector field with it. And I'm going to call my Poisson structure non-degenerate if this bundle map is an isomorphism. And if it's an isomorphism, then I can invert it. So there should be a map going the other way. And this is going to be an isomorphism from the tangent bundle to the cotangent bundle. So it's going to correspond to a two form. And this two form is going to be non-degenerate because it's making an isomorphism. And because pi satisfies the Jacobi identity, this two form is also going to be closed. So in other words, non-degenerate Poisson structures are, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with symplectic structures on them. And even more generally, uh, if my Poisson structure is not necessarily non-degenerate. I can look at the image of this bundle map pi sharp. And this is gonna be some like, generalized distribution in the tangent bundle. And it's going to be involutive. So I can integrate it to a foliation of the manifold M. So this is where like, it isn't actually necessarily true that you get a foliation by like algebraic leaves if your manifold was an algebraic variety. And so, so this is part of why I, I tried to be a bit ambiguous when, when I was talking about what M is. So if M is, is like a real manifold or a complex manifold, then, um, then I will always 
then this, this kind of like integrability thing about distributions works. But if M is just the smooth algebraic variety, it's not necessarily the case that these like involutive distributions integrate to like algebraic foliation. Oh, but that's great. But th these are things which are not, it, there's no algebraic foliation, but somehow I should think that, you know, if you were to analytify, like it's capturing that information. Yeah. Like, and, that and information also, you know. like in life, often the foliation is algebraic. Like in our examples, we will have like a symplectic fo a, a foliation by these leaves, which where everything is like a, a just a smooth subvariety. But um, so, 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 so like in practice, this, this distinction doesn't matter that much, right? At least in my life, it, it's never. Right. Uh, and and no. if it's not algebraic, I'm not offended too much. I mean, because it's, I mean, it, right. If it is algebraic, then something interesting has happened. If it's not algebraic, then it's not algebraic. But you, you, you have an algebraic way of talking about this, even mm -hmm. if you can't get the, even yeah. if there's no algebraic. I mean, the statement, everything before there is all algebraic. And then mm -hmm. you're talking about these things, which may not have the, mm -hmm. the actual, okay, this is, okay, great. Uh, so, and then, and then this, this bundle map pi sharp. So this was a map from, from T star M. And it landed on things that were tangent to L, and it's going to factor through the cotangent bundle of L. And when it factors, it's going to induce a nice amorphism. So actually, each of these leaves is going to have a symplectic structure. So these Poisson manifolds are foliated by, by symplectic foliation. So, so really, we are also now getting to talk about degenerations of symplectic things without being inconsistent. I mean, without leaving uh, it right. So this, okay, I, I think, so I think you're answering my motivational question now, uh, but uh, we're able to talk about things we could talk about before because mm -hmm. we have, uh, or that I couldn't talk about before. Okay, so so here's an example. Uh, so I, we already actually had like one family of examples, which is that any symplectic manifold is an example of a Poisson manifold. Uh, and here's here's an example of uh, of something Poisson that's not symplectic. So I, I uh, take up again my my semi simple Lie algebra, and because uh, because it's semi simple, there's a canonical way to identify it with G star. And G star has uh, something called the Kirillov constant Poisson structure, which is a Poisson bracket that I can define using sort of like the Lie algebra data. So I take uh, two functions f and g. And these are functions on G star. So, um, so this means that their differentials at a point are like co-vectors on G star. So they're elements of G. And then I can bracket them together. And then I can evaluate at that point, which was in G star. And this gives me a way of taking F and G and producing a new function on G star. And, and uh, you, I can do this for, for it on, on the dual of any Lie algebra, uh, but in our case today, our Lie algebra is always semi-simple and we're sort of gonna freely identify it with its dual when it's convenient. Uh, so in fact, the symplectic leaves of the sky are the adjoint orbits, the co-adjoint orbits. This tells us a kind of remarkable fact about these orbits, which is that they always have even dimension. And here I put a picture of SL2R, which I lifted from the paper of one of my friends. So, so on this picture, you can see the symplectic leaves, um, which look like either like single sheeted or like double sheeted hyperboloids, except for this one symplectic leaf in the middle, which is the nilpotent cone and zero, which is kind of a unique symplectic leaf of dimension zero and not two. Okay, so this is our example. And now in, uh, in the setting of Poisson manifolds, I wanna define this uh, notion called Poisson transversality. So this is gonna be a sub-manifold of M that has the property that it intersects every symplectic leaf transversely and symplectically. So the symplectic form on the leaf pulls back to a symplectic form on the intersection. And if this is the case, then the submanifold gets an induced Poisson structure, 
whose symplectic foliation is just the intersection of X with the symplectic foliation of M. So in particular, if, if M was symplectic to begin with, then Poisson transversals are exactly symplectic submanifolds. And this is kind of an open condition. So, so you know, locally at least, Poisson transversals are they always exist. Okay, uh, so we, we have already seen one example of a Poisson transversal, which is this cost and slice uh, in a semi-simple Lie algebra, which intersects every adjoint orbit that it meets, so every regular adjoint orbit in exactly one place and, um, and transversally. So this means that it intersects every symplectic leaf of G in a single point, which means that the symplectic leaves of the induced Poisson structure on S are just going to be single points. So this is, this is the zero Poisson structure. And the way that we're going to use this uh, is here's an easy lemma. Uh, so this lemma says that pullbacks of Poisson transversals under Poisson maps are also Poisson transversals. So if I have a Poisson map from, from M to N and I have a Poisson transversal downstairs and I take its preimage, I'll get a Poisson transversal upstairs. So in particular, one thing that happens is that if my Poisson manifold has what's called a Hamiltonian action of the group G. So these are actions that come with, a, with an associated object called a moment map. Then inside G, I can look at this cost and slice and I can pull it back through mu to get a Poisson transversal in M. So let's, um, let's see an example. Um, so in my example, I'll take the cotangent bundle of the group G. Question. Well, I guess I'm thinking, uh, great. So should I th so Poisson transversal, I'm roughly translating as Poisson submanifold. Is that like a very rough, uh, not quite, okay. Not quite. So um, let, me, let me go back to where I have room. Yeah, let's draw a picture. So, so what you should think is that I have my like, uh, my like manifold. Uh, this, unfortunately, this is going to be a 2D, 2D picture. And then this is foliated by symplectic leaves, which in my picture are 1D, but obviously they're not. And the Poisson bivector is like tangent to these leaves because the way that I got them was by integrating the image. But the Poisson transversal is transverse to these leaves. So, so by Poisson submanifold, we usually mean like a, a submanifold that the Poisson bivector is tangent to. And this is kind of going in the opposite direction. Okay, great. I got it. So it's absolutely, in fact, it's absolutely not. You're getting a Poisson manifold with a Poisson substructure, but it's not, it's absolutely not a Poisson. It's not. You know. So I actually, I was really kind of glazing over this point, which is that I said that like the Poisson structure on M pulls back to a Poisson structure on the transversal, but I didn't define what that means at all. And it's really not clear because we can't pull back by vectors. But what you should think of is if you think of Poisson manifolds as just things that are foliated by symplectic manifolds, then a Poisson transversal is foliated by its intersection with the leaves. Okay, so example. Um, example is the cotangent bundle of the group G. Now you can trivialize this and then I can use the killing form to identify G with G star. And that's, so this is like trivialization plus killing form. And then on this cotangent bundle, I have a two-sided action of the group. And this action has, has a moment map, which you can think of just as like a, a kind of naturally attached Poisson map to G cross G. And what this map does, I've written out, it just takes a pair of a group element A and a Lie algebra element X. And in the first coordinate, it applies A to X. And on the second coordinate, it just outputs X. So the image of this map is just gonna consist of conjugate pairs in the Lie algebra cross itself. And then downstairs in the target of this map, 
I have my cost and slice. Now I have two product of two copies of it because it's in G cross G. And these facts on the previous slide say that if I take the pre-image of this cost and slice under mu, I should get uh, some sub variety of the cotangent bundle that, uh, that is a Poisson transversal. So if I do this, the first thing to notice is that the cost and slice intersects every adjoint orbit on a single point. So if two points in the slice are conjugate, then they have to be equal. So the pre-image of S cross S is really just the pre-image of the diagonal copy of S. And of course, if you think, what, uh, what does the pre-image of a diagonal point under mu look like? It looks exactly like the centralizer of, of that point. So, so sorry, I took, yeah. Sorry, could, could I ask, when, when you're doing this construction to inter, pull back the Kirillov, was it? Uh, Kostin. Uh, mm -hmm. plus on transversal. Uh, this looks like it's a way to glue together a bunch of holomorphic symplectic quotients simultaneously or something. Uh, or sorry, okay, like a priori in particular, there's a way to take the holomorphic symplectic quotient, which is to just take mu inverse of zero and quotient by g. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's super. I think that's related in some way to yes. this construction that you're telling me now. What is that relation? Um, so let me let me first say, yeah, say the sorry, go ahead. slide, yeah. and then and then I will end. So so what what have we concluded from the slide? We concluded that we can produce this universal centralizer as a preimage of this of this uh, Poisson transversal under the moment map mu. So this means that it's a Poisson transversal in the cotangent bundle, but the cotangent bundle is symplectic. So now Poisson transversal is the same as symplectic submanifold. So this answers the question of where does the symplectic structure on Z come from? So what, what Arnav is asking about is the following thing that this, um, so, so people sometimes call this Hamiltonian reduction. When you have a, a symplectic manifold and a moment map that goes to the Lie algebra, and then you take, uh, you take the pre-image, of zero under this moment map, and you uh, quotient by the action of G. And there's something called the Mars and Weinstein theorem, which says that if M was symplectic, then this new guy, which is usually called the reduced space is also symplectic. And in fact, this is also true in, in the Poisson setting. So if M was Poisson, then M reduced is also Poisson. Uh, and in fact, you don't even, I, instead of taking the preimage of zero, I could just take a point, the preimage of some random point and mod out by its centralizer. Um, and this, this works whenever I have a group acting on, uh, on a manifold with some uh, like reasonable restrictions, like this fiber should be smooth, for example. Okay. Um, this, in particular, when your group is semi-simple, there's something called Whitaker reduction. Whitaker reduction happens when I when my x is actually um, is actually the regular null potent, but then I have to be like a little bit more careful. I don't know how to say this in a quick way. Whitaker reduction happens when I replace the action of this group G by the action of a unipotent subgroup. And then I get, I take the preimage of some kind of regular null potent element and I quotient out by the unipotent subgroup. And I get some kind of Whitaker reduced M. And this is in fact exactly the same thing as taking the preimage of this cost and slice. And, okay, sorry. So, so that's great. And then how is that related to mu inverse of zero mod G? To, well, this is, so, so this, this construction here is kind mm -hmm. of, you know, mu there's not really a reason to limit ourselves to taking mu inverse of zero mod G. In general, we can take mu inverse of anything mod whatever stabilizes that anything. So, uh -huh. so in this particular case, 
you're taking mu inverse of at a, at a like a regular null potent element, which you can think of as some kind of like like deformation of mu inverse at zero. Like I could shrink my regular null potent in mm -hmm. kind of continuous way, and then I would get like more familiar Hamiltonian reduction at zero. Is there a family in which all these guys live or something? Like where your Whitaker reduction specializes to the okay. Yeah, but but always so so even in you know in the family even mu inverse mod zero is mu inverse mod zero for the action of a unipotent group. I see. And then okay. it then there are, in general like quotienting by unipotent groups is like complicated. So right. Uh, yeah. I see. Okay. And and uh, sorry, last question on this real quick. Uh, if I had a hypercalar structure, as I do in the case of D star G, then the Hamiltonian reduction preserves that hypercalar structure. Is there anything you could say about that for like these Whitaker reductions or anything more complicated? I think this is definitely also true for Whitaker reduction because it's just a special case of Hamiltonian reduction. In particular, for, for the preimages of, of this um, of this custom slice S. Cool. The the reason the reason that that um that that I that I explain this using preimages of S and instead of Hamiltonian reduction, which would have given me essentially the same thing, except I, I would have had to like compute a quotient at some point, uh, is that I well depending on like time, which like there probably isn't going to be time, but <laughs> but if there was time, I would tell you like a sort of groupy version of this, where like instead of going to the Lie algebra, moment maps go to the group and. Um, and if I did that, then there would be no more Whitaker reduction. Um, so, so there, there would have to be some replacement. But that we're probably not going to get to that part of the talk. So, um, so in any case, so, so we we defined this notion of Poisson transversal, and then we saw that this universal centralizer was just a transversal in the cotangent bundle of G. Okay. So now, uh, now we're going to return to the question of like compactifying. The centralizer, and and in order to the, the kind of strategy to do this is to enlarge the cotangent bundle of G to some kind of bigger bundle over uh, the wonderful compactification, so over G bar, and then play exactly the same game with um, with the cost and slice. So so let me say what this enlargement will be. It will be something called the the log cotangent bundle of G bar. So this is the, the bundle whose sections are differential forms that have logarithmic poles along D. And that's because D is a normal crossings divisor, the sheaf of logarithmic differential forms is locally free. So it corresponds to a vector bundle. And this is that vector bundle. And now if you remember that, um, you know, the cotangent bundle of any manifold has a canonical symplectic structure that you can just build out of the bundle map. The cotangent bundle of um, the, the log cotangent bundle of a manifold with a normal crossings divisor has something called a log symplectic structure. So this is basically um, a closed non-degenerate logarithmic two-form. And it also corresponds, so it's a two-form that gets logarithmic poles along the boundary divisor D. And this corresponds to a Poisson structure that's kind of generically non-degenerate, but then it vanishes along the boundary divisor. But it vanishes with a multiplicity that's like somehow minimal. So with multiplicity one along like the, the generic locus of each irreducible component, and then when two components intersect with multiplicity two and when three components intersect and so forth. So in particular, if I take this log, uh, this log symplectic two form, and I just restrict it to the copy of the cotangent bundle of G that's sitting inside this log cotangent bundle, and I get back the usual symplectic structure on T star G. Um, and and the, the kind of remarkable thing about the log cotangent bundle of G bar in particular is that it has a very, very concrete description as a, as a bundle of Lie algebras. So in other words, it, it fits into this diagram that I've drawn here, and I'll say exactly how. So this cotangent bundle of G, by trivializing and using the killing form, I can identify with group cross Lie algebra. And then I have a map from here all the way to the, to the trivial uh, G cross G bundle on G bar 
that just maps AX to A at AX, X. And if I take the closure of the image of this embedding, I will get this log cotangent bundle of G bar. So the, the generic fiber, like over the open locus of the log cotangent bundle is going to look just like a copy of the Lie algebra. And then as you go to the boundary of G bar, the Lie algebra is gonna to degenerate to some other Lie algebra that's no longer semi-simple, for example. And in particular, you can see that like the moment map from the cotangent bundle of G is really just projection onto the fibers of this trivial G cross G bundle. So now we can sort of replay the same story as before. Uh, we have the, the Poisson manifold, which is the log cotangent bundle of G bar. It has a log symplectic structure and an action of, of the group on both sides. And this gives us a moment map that extends the moment map on T star G, which was the map that mapped AX to add AX comma X. So in particular, because mu bar is now like a proper map, the image of mu with conjugate pairs the image of mu bar is going to be pairs of elements in the Lie algebra that are in the closure of the same conjugacy class. And then once again, I can take the cost and slice in G cross G and I can pull it back under this moment map mu bar. And because two regular elements are in the closure of the same adjoint orbit, if and only if they're equal, this is the same as just pulling back um, the diagonal copy of the slice. And this earlier lemma tells us that this pullback is a Poisson transversal in the log cotangent bundle. So theorem, says that this Poisson transversal is actually the, the relative compactification of C that I was looking for. So in particular, this regular compactification is smooth and it has a log symplectic structure that's extending the symplectic structure we originally had on the universal centralizer. So the situation is really as nice as you can possibly help. Yes, yes. Um, so maybe uh, let me say some, some things about, on, on the one hand, the, the, what the slog symplectic structure looks like on Z bar, and on the other hand, about what some of these fibers look like uh, in, in the remaining time. So, um, so remember that the wonderful compactification of G had a decomposition into G cross G orbits that were indexed by subsets of simple roots. So because Z-bar is, um, is just a, a family of compactified centralizers indexed by the slice, this is going to give me like a stratification of Z-bar into just strata of pairs AX, where A is in the closure of the centralizer of X and also in the J of orbit of the wonderful compactification. And, um, and what I want to describe is how each of these strata decomposes into symplectic leaves. Because Z bar is, is you said a, a Poisson manifold and it's log symplectic. So it has like an open dense symplectic leaf, which is the old universal centralizer. But then on the boundary, the boundary has co-dimension one. So there are gonna be many, many symplectic leaves in the boundary. So you have to have co-dimension at least two. Uh, and they're going to be indexed in some kind of nice way by, uh, by like the simple roots of the group G. So remember that we had um, uh, for every collection of simple roots, the corresponding orbit fibered over this product of partial flag varieties. And each flag variety G mod P just encodes like all of the parabolics 
conjugate to P. So in particular, for every element of OJ, I get a pair of parabolic subalgebras. And for each of these parabolic subalgebras, there's a canonical map from the parabolic PA to this quotient PJ mod its derived subalgebra. So instead of saying what this is um, in full detail, I'm going to tell you what it is when PJ is just a Borel. So the Borel is in SLN, just the upper triangular matrices. And the derived subalgebra of the Borel, what I get when I, when I take the, the Lie bracket of two Borel elements is something that's strictly upper triangular. So the derived subalgebra is strictly triangular matrices. So when I take the quotient, the only thing that survives is the diagonal elements. And what this map CA is doing is it's taking an element X in the parabolic PA and it's picking out the eigenvalues of X with some ordering. In other words, you can think that it's taking X, it's conjugating it into the Borel, and then it's just telling you what's on the diagonal. So this is the case when, when the parabolic is a Borel, um, the, this map picks out eigenvalues with order. In the case where the parabolic is like more general, then this map is going to pick out eigenvalues with order that lie in the center of the corresponding levy. And then the statement is that the symplectic leaves uh, in, in a, the stratum corresponding to some set of simple roots are just the fibers of this map. So in other words, I, if we take two points of the form AX uh, in ZJ and we ask, are they in the same symplectic leaf? In order to answer this question, we just look at the parabolics associated to the A's, take the image of X under this map CA and then see if it's the same both times. Okay. Uh, and the last thing I wanna say about this, this compactified centralizer family is, um, is to give some description of the compactified centralizer fibers. So we already said that the semi-simple fibers uh, are Torg varieties that look like um, the Torg variety corresponding to the fan of vial chambers. And then the, as the fibers degenerate, we'll get, um, we'll get a collection of varieties that are, that are part of a class of things called Hessenberg varieties. So I'll say just a little bit what, what these are. It's sort of like partial definition. Um, so, so consider the following subspace of the Lie algebra. I so are these going to be the Hessenberg I heard of as Schubert's intersect anti-Schubert's? Or is that what they're going to be? Or oh, is different? You're thinking of Richardson. Oh, crap. You're right. Ah, oh, cool. now forgot what Hessenberg. But, but, these, but these are going to live in the flag variety. OK, great. Now I'm going to remember what they were. You're going to remind me. OK, good. OK, sorry. Go ahead. OK, so, so we take, we take this, the subspace of the Lie algebra G that's given by, uh, on the one hand, B, so this is upper triangular things. And then the negative simple root spaces. So these are the entries right below the diagonal. And then zeros everywhere else. And uh, this space is stable under the action of the Borel. Because if I conjugate a matrix that looks like this by something upper triangular, it's going to move things upwards. So this means that I can take the associated bundle G cross H over B. And this is a vector bundle over the flag variety G mod B. And it has a natural map that goes to the Lie algebra where I just take a pair of elements G and Y and apply G to Y under the adjoint action. And the Hessenberg varieties are the fibers of this map. 
So this should look to you like if instead of H, uh, I had just taken B, then these would be like growth and Springer fibers. Okay, uh, and and what what's known and it's sort of not hard to to check by hand is that if X is uh, a regular semi simple element, then the corresponding Hessenberg variety is the Cox eder Twark variety. And the rest, so, so the, the, the last thing that I want to say is that this extends in, in the way that you would hope. So, so this family of compactified centralizers over S looks is isomorphic to a family of Hessenberg varieties over S. And every compactified centralizer fiber is isomorphic to the corresponding Hessenberg variety. In um, particular, the various things are known about these Hessenberg varieties. So like when X is a regular null potent element, then this corresponding Hessenberg variety is something called the Peterson variety. And this is uh, not normal, for example, except in small rank. So the, the fibers of this family do get sort of like pretty singular as you leave the semi-simple locus. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop here. <laughs>